good evening. Like I always say, there are seven continents in the world, seven billion people. This is Atlanta Discuss. Different time zones. I know some people are just waking up, some places is in the morning, somewhere it's midday, some is late evening. So that's why I always say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what part of the globe you are in. So my name remains Ade Balogun. I'm still your host for Atlanta Discuss. And today we are going to continue our discussion on the postmortem on the Nigeria Supreme Court judgment and the future of elections in Nigeria. As usual in our tradition, we we'll always come with guests that will go for the juggler. That will be true to power, say it the way it is. Because here at Atlanta Discuss, we just go for the facts and that's all we do. Today we have with us Professor Chris Mustafa Onwakobia. He's new on Atlanta Discuss. I'm sure he'll be coming regularly. So, but he's our guest today. Prof, welcome to Atlanta Discuss. Good morning. It is my pleasure to be on with you. Interestingly, <laughs> I share a fondness with the city of Atlanta, where my mentor, Martin Luther King Jr., was the preacher that led the struggle for uh, liberation for our people there. All right, fantastic. As you all know, Professor Chris Mustafa Wakobia is the convener of the Country First Movement. He was also a member of the Liberal Party Presidential Campaign Council for the Gobitati campaign. You know, I know it's not in existence now, but it's part of his resume because it was part of that. He's also a former presidential aspirant, social procedure, public commentator. You know, so he's an opinionated Nigerian, is a patriot. So that's why we brought him here to look at that Supreme Court judgment, that judgment that, you know, everybody is talking about. You know, we're, we're not just going to talk about that judgment. We'll veer into the economy because Nigeria is really a troubled country. That's why we always lay a lot of emphasis. You all know already that one out of every four sub Saharan African is a Nigerian, one out of every six black people in the world is a Nigerian. So the importance of Nigeria cannot be emphasized. The bacon of the black world, which is clearly, clearly acting behind schedule. So, but having said that, let's just go for the juggler like we always do. Prof, the Supreme Court judgments. I know you're a Labour Party member, you support the Obidati campaign group and all that. The Supreme Court has ruled. What is your own general overview of that judgment from the Supreme Court? Beyond partisanship, because I tell people that after everything we do on planet Earth, there are three things that are fundamentally inescapable. And whether you're partisan, whether you're not, these three things are fundamental. Uh, you would leave, if you work well and do well, you will leave a legacy. If you don't work well and, and you don't do anything to leave a legacy, you will still die like every mortal. So fundamentally, I won't color the 26th of October ruling of the Supreme Court with partisanship. I won't look at it from partisan angles. I look at it from fundamental angle within the precincts of justice. You ask yourself first, what the Supreme Court justices did on the 26th of October? Did he work for justice? Or was it just about partisanship and technicalities at play? And fundamentally, anybody who looked at that judgment will understand that several things were thrown back at the Nigerian people. It was beyond politics qua politics. It was about people who were desperate to seal the 6th of September larceny of the presidential election petition tribunal. On the 6th of September, some justices sat down, chose technicalities over justice, and decreed in their ruling that the president won the elections. They refused to look at fundamental issues as to whether he was qualified for that election. They refused to look at whether he had perjured on that oath. They refused to look at whether his forfeiture in the United States of America of drug-related funds would affect his candidacy. They refused to look at whether he complied with the provisions of the Constitution and the Electoral Act regarding meeting a certain percentage of votes cast in Abuja. They refused to look at the fundamental issues that should make a president like Caesar's wife to be above board. And they were more interested in technicalities, what time an action was filed, how election matters were sui generis, how the petitioners did not, according to them, prove their cases. I call it the day the Nigerian judiciary chose 
technicalities over justice, and I call it the day they murdered the tripod on which electoral contestation should exist. You know that when you talk about elections, when you talk about democracy, the strongest arm on which democracy thrives is the transparency of the electoral process. Unfortunately, on the 25th of February, 2023, the electoral umpire, Mahmoud Yakubu and his team, bungled the hopes of people of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And I tell you, some people will ask, why would you use the word bungled? If you win an election, look at what happened in Liberia yesterday. Even those who lost were jubilant because Judge Opongwe showed character. He said to his people, it's not hope denied. We can come back in 2029. I haven't won, but Liberia has won. In what should be Africa's biggest and greatest democracy, what won was snatch it, run away with it, the power is not served the Lakat. We had blood, sorrow, tears on the streets of Nigeria, from Lagos to Karunamuda, from Karunamuda to Podakot, from Podakot to Delta. Across our space, we had sorrow, tears, and blood. And then you ask yourself, what democracy thrives that way? And then instead of the judiciary to look dispassionately at these issues, people tell us that, oh, electoral matters are sui generis, electoral matters are presumed, decorous and in order, except it is proven by the petitioners that it is not. And so the presumption is in favor of INEC. INEC that collected about $320 billion, told us they were going to transmit results premium time through the IRF, and never did. You're presuming due process in their favor. I know that admitted that they had glitches. You're presuming it in their favor. I don't understand. So when on the 26th of October, the Supreme Court sat in judgment and proceeded to affirm all that, the one that gave me goosebumps was the one about after the struggle by the PDP presidential candidate to get certain depositions coming from at Chicago State University and the city of Chicago. The Supreme Court said those materials came out of time, you know. And I asked myself, my little boy asked me, and I had to wander over the night. I asked myself several times. So God forbid Hush Poppy was to come back from jail in America and hide from the law for 10 years. After 10 years, he suffices with so much money and says he wants to be the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, he will quote the Supreme Court judgment that 10 years has gone, and so he's presumed fit and proper to run. That's what the Supreme Court told us. Some people are not clear-headed enough to look at it that way. What you're saying is, whatever you do, hide from the law for 10 years. And then you're surprised. That's what the judgment was. Hide from the law for 10 yeah. years. And then when you come back after 10 years, the judges... They will quote the highest court in the land and say, what are you talking about? He has a right to run. After 10 years, he should be forgiven. You know. So you ask yourself what happens to the moral margins of a nation and our children, your children. You ask yourself what lines we're drawing as a people. Then the issue of Abuja, they told us Abuja is like every other state. And you ask yourself how. Does Abuja have a governor? Does Abuja have three senators? Abuja has only one senator. Abuja is uniquely governed by the president through a minister, and the laws for order and good governance of Abuja comes from the National Assembly. So every other state has a governor, its own assembly that makes laws for the order and good governance of the state. And you ask yourself, what makes Abuja like every other state? You know. And I'll give you a proper praxis. When we were writing for admission into the university. There's always this requirement of the jam and the schools. They will tell you, if you're going for law, for instance, they'll tell you English language, English literature, and any other three subjects. If you're going for medicine, they'll tell you physics, chemistry, biology, English, and mathematics. Um, are they, if you do not have the subjects, if you like, bring 20 subjects that you have passed. If you don't have for law and English literature, you cannot be admitted. If you're going in for medicine, that and is conjunctive. If you have all the sciences and you do not have 
English and biology or English and mathematics, you will not be admitted. So it is not about the number of states. It's about the uniqueness. And don't forget that this requirement of the constitution predicates that the person who must govern should be deemed popular. That's actually the, you know, it's not about grammar. You know, mm -hmm. it's about the popularity of a candidate in the place where he wants to govern. That's why you say that if you must be declared a governor, you win to third of the local governments in the state. If you want to be the president, you win to third of votes cast in 36 states and Abuja. Simple English. But you know what? There's this practice when money talks, bullshit. When money talks, bullshit happens. Unfortunately, it was a highly procured, and for me, my choice of words, and the words are strictly mine, procured verdict. The judiciary chose technicalities over justice. And very importantly, I think that the time has come for us as a people to begin to critique what happens in our country because a highly progressive world is looking at us with some kind of derision, some kind of surprise and wonderment. As I talk to you and to Nigerians in the diaspora and people who are listening to us, we must see our position on these issues beyond partisanship. We must look at the life of our constitution. We must look at how we put due process and justice over technicalities. We must look at how we draw moral margins for a new country that must indeed be responsible and responsive to our people. And we must be committed to ensuring that we have a country where decency, decorum, and due process is a summon bonum. I think that's fundamentally what we're talking about. So it is not about me. You see, in all that I said for the past few minutes, I haven't called the name of my party, the Labour Party. I haven't called the name of Peter Gregory OB. I haven't called the name of Peter Gregory OB. And I haven't talked about the APC as a party. I'm talking about our nation. And that's very instructive because I'm the convener of Country First Movement. I mm -hmm. am thinking about the nation that serves Musa effectively. I'm thinking about a nation that caters to the needs of Tunde without uh, equivocation. I'm talking about a country that cares about Chukudumibi uh, in Delta. Uh, I'm talking about a country that cares about uh, Wike, about everybody. And the only way to do so is to ensure that we adhere strictly to the rule of law. The judiciary should be the hope of the common man. But unfortunately and clearly so, uh, Nigerians are beginning to doubt the commitment of the judiciary for the well-being and the common good. And i tell you why I've just said so. In Kogi a few days ago, there was an election. You saw the figure. That was supposed to be the follow-up, but you might as well go into Yeah. Yeah, but okay, now I'm a clairvoyant. Now I'm Nostradamus. <laughs> in Kogi, there was an election. And you saw the figures that came in, just like Imo. The only one that appeared a bit sane, I use the word a bit because there were sorrow, tears, and blood there also, was by Elsa. And note that none of these parties have an alleged loser coming from my party. But in Kogi, the man who was closest, when they asked him on Channels TV if he was going to go to court, he was clear enough to say, to which court? To which court? Is it a court that belongs to them? Or is it a court that will do justice? You know, and when a nation begins to lose faith in its judiciary, that nation is in trouble. I don't want to use the word the nation is doomed because I always believe in the converse side of discourse and debate. I know that there's a God who runs the human pilgrimage, who brought a boisterous planet out of primal vapor, and that God is not dead. And interestingly, Ade, so that you can ask your next question, let me tell you why I'm enamored, why I woke up and said I must make this interview. I said to myself, Atlanta is a city of Martin Luther King Jr. I'm passionate, <laughs> I'm passionate about some of the things he taught the world. And then he said that disobedience of an unjust law is in itself the greatest respect for the law. He also, at some rally, quoted Khalil. Khalil said long time ago that no lie can live forever. He quoted Colin William Brown, who said, truth crushed to earth will rise again. For those who enjoy the larceny, who enjoy the miscarriage of justice, who are standing on a certain 
curious mandate. I say to them, no lie can live forever. I say to them, truth cross to earth will rise again. Fantastic. Yeah. You can say I, I didn't disturb you. I didn't tangent you. I wanted you to give a general overview and you've done excellently well. And I, I think it's also important for our viewers that uh, one of the reasons why we invited you is not because you're a member of the Labour Party. You've been there for a very long time and you've also spoken truth to power. And naturally, everybody is partisan one way or the other, but you've spoken well. But my follow up question was going to be Kogi Bayelsa and uh, Imo State. Yeah. I wanted to ask that. The Supreme Court judgment, did it give more impetus for people to rig and disorganize election in Nigeria? Because I've spoken on so many occasions about the 2022 Electoral Act, which I think to a very large extent was not added to. You said it also, 350 billion for an election, technology and all that did not work. Now, going forward with what we have seen in Kogi, Bayelsa, and I think Imo State, do you think we can still have free and fair election in Nigeria this week? You see, I never give up on humankind. <laughs> Interestingly, <laughs> I have mentors who believe, it was Madiba, Nelson Rulich Lala Mandela, who said that the time is always right to do right and that his faith in humankind is infinite. Can we get it right? Yes, but that's depending on several normatives. Have we done poorly? Yes, we've done extremely badly. But I'll start with your first question. Kogi, Bayelsa, and Imo. You know, 48 hours to that election, I wrote a piece. And I dared everybody who didn't agree with me to force that piece. I captured the piece, Imo, Kogi, and Bayelsa of season election. Why expect fairness and peace when snatch it and run with it is in the saddle. And in one of the paragraphs, I said, a thousand peace accords will not guarantee peace. I said a million policemen will not guarantee peace because there are three fundamental normatives that will work against it. In the saddle is a man who said that power is not served at la carte. You snatch it, you mm -hmm. run away with it. And so what happened in those three off-cycle elections was they added a third leg to it, kill for it. And so we saw people who were killed in Kogi, in Bayasa, and in Imo. And people are still killing as aftermath of that election. You've been following the news. Now, mm -hmm. I said also that with the new cliche in town, go to court, when in actuality, go to court means we own the courts. What will happen is that those who want power will do anything for it. Um, are, they, are you aware that in Imo State, the total accredited voters were less than 500,000? Are you aware that oh, the total wow. votes allocated to the candidates was over 700,000? So where did they get the 200,000 plus votes from? Are you aware that even with the voter party, there were local governments that pulled 124,000, 148,000 votes in Kogi State, when in actuality, when you had the presidential election, all the votes that came out of Kogi was almost not up to the vote of the person who won the Kogi election. All the votes <laughs> that they cast for presidency. And then you ask yourself, with the fear, the killings in Kogi started a week before the elections. With the app party, how did they pull so much votes? You know, some kind of abracadabra. And then you ask yourself in Bayelsa with only about eight local governments. This will make you laugh. The results from Bayelsa did not come in until about Monday, Tuesday, and then you ask yourself, eight local governments couldn't pull in results early enough. In most states with about 27 local governments pulled in the results in premium time. And some people will make the argument, oh, Bayelsa has water, creeks, and all that. And then you ask yourself, does it take 12 hours to go by the waters? Now, what am I trying to say? It was because the people of Bayelsa stood up and said, we will not allow the writing of results. We must allow the process. And they were threatening to go on riots if those figures as being falsified were allowed in. It's on record that the former president, Jonathan, had to call the president and say, I don't want trouble in my home state. Please tell INF to do the right thing. What am I trying to say? Clearly and very clearly so. What we had on the November 11th was a charade by every definition. And it thumbs down when you consider 
the fact that people expected that Mahmoud Yaqub and his team will rise up to the challenge after the monstrous larceny of February the 25th and March the 18th. But you know what? All hope is not lost, like I said. We must concertedly, and that's why I salute what you're doing. God will bless you and your team. Because what is important is that we must have those who can speak truth to power, who can say it as it is. A nation dies when voices of discord, voices of disagreement, voices of discontent are stifled. A nation dies when people are unable to say truth to power. A nation suffers irredeemably when people bend their backs to larceny, malfeasance, criminality, and so it doesn't matter. We can just move on. And I tell you, if we continue to do what we're doing right now, what you're doing is lining up moral lines, and you're wishing that some day Nigerians will listen and say to their brothers and sisters at home, we must get our country back on track. Because no matter what, home will always be home. No matter what we do and where we live, our ancestors and our brothers and sisters who live in Africa seek a nation and a continent that works for all. And the only way you can ensure that leadership works for you is to draw strong moral margins. Do you allow criminals to superintend your nations? Do you allow people who have querulous and questionable credentials and certificates to superintend your nation? Do you lower your moral bars and moral margins? Do you say, oh, let's just move on. Let's just go ahead as uh, a national script? If you do all this, then your nation will remain in trouble. But if you have voices that will say, never ever again. If you have voices that would say enough is enough. If you have voices that would say that gentlemen and women, if you call it a democracy, it must be truly of the people, by the people, and for the people. And that's what Nigerians are asking for. And I want to believe that the National Assembly will rise up to the challenge. We're pushing them for further amendments to the Electoral Act. You will not have an electoral empire take 320 billion and then it comes back to tell you that we had glitches or hitches. <laughs> and nobody's been called to order. Nobody's been fired. Nobody's been tried for these glitches or hitches. And you have heard Amazon say, this kind of glitches and hitches gets fixed in less than 30 minutes. The glitches were on for several days because some people deliberately compromised the electoral process. And they're not being called to book. They're not being asked to account for the money spent. And people are saying, oh, let's move ahead. The election has come and gone. What about our moral margins as people? Now, with what happened in Kobe, Bayelsa, and Imo, we have come to realize that the election truly has not come and gone. Because what we had was a further lowering of the bar. I tell you, if nothing is done at day to right these wrongs, if nothing is done to call the electoral umpire to order, if nothing is done to correct this malfeasance, democracy is as good as compromised irredeemably in Nigeria. Wow, wow, wow. You've spoken your heart, you've spoken truth to power. That's a fear a lot of us have, a lot of people all over the world have. That I mean, there's nothing to be diplomatic about. The elections are really nothing to write home about. It is clear for all to see. And Liberia, is a country Nigeria intervened some years back, you know, God with Ecomo to bring sanity back to them, as shown clearly when an incumbent lost power and told his people congratulate them. I mean, it's really commendable. And I think all two sons of Nigeria should be ashamed, at least of Heine of how we conducted the election. It, it was really, 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 really bad. Let's look at solution proper. You know, I've heard you say, if they don't, if they don't, if we don't, and all that. Yeah, that sounds like, okay, if this doesn't happen, if the grand doesn't know, let to organize this election, we know it's disgraceful, it's bad enough, and all that. Now, let's look at solution proper. How can we get out of this morass of inability to organize free and fair election? I mean, Nigeria is the largest concentration of Black people in, on the planet. We are clearly behind schedule in the United States where I live. We are the most educated migrating block, you know. And I've, I've, I've seen research that show that we're probably the most educated migrating block to almost two, three, or some we even say four continents in the world, you know. And guys are everywhere, you know. So we have 
proving that capacity, mental capacity, intellectual capacity, we have the ability. You know, so how do we get out of this? What do you think are the solutions? Considering, okay, President has been elected, the Supreme Court is the final arbiter in this regard. It does look like bearing any, you have to start the stamp anyway, you know, but it does look like nothing is going to change. So what's your solution? What's your panacea to be in the extreme league? I have told our countrymen the challenge on my person is to try to profile solutions. And so that's why your last question got me a bit emotional. Now we have identified the problems. Now we see how bad it has become. Now we're troubled. Nigerians are home and Nigerians in the diaspora are troubled about the future of our democracy. And they're asking, which way Nigeria? Remember that old song, uh, which way to which go? Way I, I your question <laughs> in that song. You know, and now we're back to that question, which way Nigeria? And then you remember a piece I wrote some time ago that has become a regular cliche, why we're where we are. You know, mm-hmm. oftentimes we're where we are because people refuse to speak truth to power. People uh, decide to dance in the side where it seems to butter their bread or favor them. And they forget that life is a continuum. And don't forget that some time ago, the PDP told us that we we're going to rule for 50 years. So where is the PDP today? You know, so I think that people must learn to understand that history and humankind is existentially in a flux. We move from one point to the other. And I believe that sooner rather than later, what will define our politics and our emotions and our temperament will be that which is good for the masses of our people. Ultimately, it will happen. When those who ran down South Africa in the name of apartheid thought that things wouldn't work, it took 27 years in jail for a Nelson Rulich Lala Mandela and some of his men to redefine and redesign the moral fabrics of South African politics. When it was happening in America, women couldn't vote. The blacks had their rights to vote stifled or stunted. The preacher from Atlanta, Georgia, rose up and said to Americans, we cannot move out of this band except we give to our brothers and sisters uh, who are Blacks, the right to vote. And he told them that the world is watching us. So back to your question pointedly, how do we fix this? We must challenge the National Assembly to further electoral review. We must ensure that those words that are not definite, the indefinite words that allowed INEP to play with the politicians against our collective wish, made more definite. We must have words like electronic accreditation must be ahead to, results must be uploaded on the server for Nigerians and the party agents to be able to see, verify, and approve of as what happened at the units, the wards, and the local government before results are announced. We must have premium time deployment of technology. That's on the one hand for the electoral umpire. And then we must ensure that we give life to the requirements or provisions of Justice Ways, who said that the president should not be the one to appoint the INEC chairman, but perhaps a college of justices and in tandem with the National Assembly should be able to do so, so that the INEC chairman will say, oh, I cannot just be fired by the president. I can only be fired by those who appointed me. And I'm answerable to the Nigerian people through whose representatives and judges I was appointed. That's for the electoral umpire. And then for the political parties, we must understand that anybody, and that also goes for Nigerians, anybody who steals your mandate, who pays money to get your vote, will naturally recoup his money. You lack the moral nexus to ask a man who gives you 5000 for your vote. To, you lack the moral measures to ask him to perform because he got the money from somewhere, he's got to return it. Then, very importantly, and this is germane to this discourse, we must ensure that politics is not the only business or the very big business in Nigeria. I don't know whether you know that a senator in Nigeria in two months makes the exact monies that the American president makes in about a year. I don't know whether you know that a member of the House of Representatives in two months receives much more money than the Vice President of the United States of America. So, 
You ask yourself, why won't people go to the bank to borrow money to run for elections? Why won't people sell their properties to run for elections? So when the stakes are high, not morally, but materially, politicians will snatch for it, steal for it, kill for it, and run away with it. You know, so we must begin now to do something differently. You cannot have a professor who is teaching in the university at less than 1.5 million naira salary per month. And you have a House of Reps member who perhaps never went to school at over 12 million per month. What nation grows that way? Where's the dignity of hard work and labor? Where's your moral margins as a nation? So we must begin to redefine it. Now, if a professor, no matter how committed he is to teaching, or a doctor, no matter how committed he is to his service, if he adheres strictly to due process in Nigeria, if he were to work for 30 years, he cannot save up to 160 million naira. In Nigeria, you give to lawmakers who, as it were, are supposed to serve the people a car worth 160 million, and you think your politics will be representative and serve the people. Where in the world do you sow coconut and reap cassava? Where in the world do you do that? And you expect to do that in Nigeria? So there must be a moral reward of everything that happens politically in this country. We must redefine the salaries and emolument of public office holders. We must do that. And for those who think that the Bola Ahmed Tinubu government will do well without redefining these moral margins, without revisiting the salaries and emolument of public office holders, without cutting cost of governance, that person is this is like the proverbial wait for Godot. You can't expect due process when you're not doing things rightly. You can't expect things to happen and work well when roguery is the definition of a policy of state. When individuals who are in government, all about me, myself, and I. So what am I trying to say? I try to tell you that certain things must happen before you can get things right. We must reevaluate our moral margins as a nation. We must engage in review of our electoral act and provisions of the constitution that has to do with elections and governance. We must check our revenue allocation policy and ensure that our nation gives primacy to patriotism and service to our people rather than profligacy. You don't tell me that lawmakers need a 160 million naira SUV when the roads are bad and people can't even move from point A to point B. Mm-hmm. You don't tell me that lawmakers who are the wise to serve the nation need so much in billions when the local governments are dysfunctional and local governments are supposed to be the closest to the people. No local government chairman gets that much to run his local government. You don't tell me that this country can get out of the morass and out of the bend when those who superintend over our country do not know that they must cut down on recurrent expenditure. Yeah, well, as you and I problem. talk, as you and I talk, let me just chisel this in. You know about billions for the first lady office. The first lady office is not an office known to the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So you ask yourself, where are these monies coming from? You ask yourself, what are you renovating? The president just left the villa and we know the shape of the villa. So why are you spending billions, as much as 13, 15 billion on renovation? You ask yourself, why? Our leaders, quote unquote, rulers, unable to understand and internalize the challenges of our people. And Mandela said, as I wind down so you can ask your next question, Mandela said something that the reason he's unhappy with Nigeria is that Nigeria has consistently produced leaders who are selfish, egocentric, and they make their individual wishes look like a collective wish. They make their individual greed and egos look like a national greed and ego. And for that reason, he refused to visit Nigeria after he came out of prison, despite all that Nigeria did for him. Nigeria is supposed to be an example to every country in Africa, and indeed to the new world, for two fundamental reasons. You cited, I'm aware that you know, Ade, that the most educated, most urban, most exposed immigrant community in the whole of America it's not even the Jewish community. It's the Nigerian community. We have the best brains and the best minds. I'm aware that you have seen the strikes of Nigerians in Europe, across the world. And you ask yourself, 
How come a people who are so obeyed, who are so exposed, who are so educated, how come their country is in tatters? How come their country mm -hmm. seems unable to get anything right? And that breaks my heart every day I think of it. And clearly it's about leadership. And we must redefine the margins of leadership in this country. Now, what I was going to say when I was about interjecting was that now everything you've said is more or less premised on constitutional amendment, the upper house and the lower house, senators and all that. My question is, why do you think people that are the major beneficiary, the major parasitic nutritionists, these are the people that actually enjoy from the morals, from the moral decadence in the country. Why do you think they will change the status quo? I mean, it's not just APC. I know when an APC majority, APC presidency, APC majority in Senate and, and House of Reps. So they have benefited clearly from this. Why do you think they want to change that? Don't also forget that PDP from 1999 to 2015, before they lost power too, where well, they clearly misbehaved. Maybe not this bad, but they did. They more or less set the foundation for this because most of the guys in APC are saying, why are you all making noise about it now? When PDP was there, Look at the way they took over the Southwest. The Ngige issue is still fresh in our memories and all that. So based on your panacea, your solution so far, preferred, we need to change laws. We need to think out of the box. But the people you are delegating to do this are still these legislators. Why do you think the major beneficiaries of all the problems we have want to change it? Let me say clearly that in historicity, people never just get to do things until they are made to do it. So... Mm -hmm. We're not like a people who are chained to the whims and the caprices of those who are benefiting from the rot. We're not like them. We're not in that shoes. Again, I think I'm in the Martin Luther mood today. Again, Martin Luther King Jr. said something. He said, an individual cannot ride your back except it is bent. For so long, our people have had their backs bent. For so long, our people laugh when they're not tickled. For so long, our people applaud this larceny on account of either ethnicity and religion. But you know what? There's a new cliche in town. Last, last, everybody go chop breakfast. Last, last, we're all in the same Titanic. Last, last, everybody feels the pain. You go to the regular filling station to buy fuel. You go to the same market. So now everybody's increasingly being forced to get out of partisanship. And you know what is funny about this, Adi? Those who are crying the more are those who a few months ago were singing for us on your mandate, on your mandate, on your mandate we shall stand. That's referring to those who supported the incumbent president. You know, they are the ones who are crying more because I don't know where they got the impression that he was going to perform some magic. They are the ones who are saying, why are you appointing so much more ministers when you're supposed to thin down on your cabinet? Why are you spending so much money? And now the Navy even went to get a yacht without approval of the National Assembly. Why is it about money, money, money? They are the ones who are now asking, how come you never had OML licenses a few months ago? Now, in less than six months of your presidency, you are alleged to have acquired four oil marginal licenses. And they are the ones who are more baffled. We saw it. We warned Nigerians about it. Now, where are we? We're all getting into the same Titanic. Where sooner rather than later, like Rosper said, when the poor have nothing to eat, they will eat the rich. When this whole trouble snowballs, when hunger becomes a uniting factor, you will cease to see the APC, the PDP, or the Labour Party supporter. You will see Nigerians united in want, Nigerians united in need. So what will happen? We'll go to the National Assembly and insist on these normatives. Um, all over the world, people redefine their nation through, one, the power of the media, information. Two, the power of the civil society, NGOs, CBOs, and several other organizations will begin to align, have conferences, seminars, colloquiums, and symposiums where they will push a narrative for national change and progress. You remember a day that it was the CBOs and NGOs who pushed the not too young to run bill, and we got it true. Remember also that it was young people 
in October 2020, who stood up and said no to SARS. And although it was with some very definite costs, some fatalities, but they pulled through an initiative. You know, there's nothing stronger than an idea whose time has come. That was what Victor Hugo said a long time ago. And nothing is truer than that. So when I talk about electoral reforms, when I talk about the appointing protocols of the INET chairman, when I talked about the need to reevaluate our collective morality, I am passionately giving a validation to the power of the people over the people in power. I'm saying clearly that we can mobilize the people and do so peacefully, like the preacher from Atlanta would say, that if we do not learn to get certain things done peacefully and we opt for it violently, we destroy ourselves and leave the world with a pile of hate. So I think that what we're doing, words are powerful. You know, are they, Islam believes that the universe came out of words. Judaism believes that the universe came out of words. Christianity believes that the universe came out of words. And almost all the, the great religions of the world believes in the power of the words. And every revolution has come out of words. And I tell people who say, oh, you guys talk too much in Nigeria, to go and check the number of speeches Martin Luther King Jr. gave in five years. Go and check the number of speeches Malcolm X gave in five years. Go and check the number of speeches Mandela gave before he went to jail and what he continued to do. So it's about the power of words. I believe that we must continue to preach and talk to the soul of a nation in darkness. And I believe that if we continue to do this, mobilize, talk with people, organize rather than agonize, if we continue to show faith in our ability to transform our country and take it out of the jangling discord of pain, poverty, nanity, and want to the amazing place of promise, true concerted action, these things can be achieved. So I'm not in denial of the fact that those who superintend the National Assembly or who live in Asorok are beneficiaries of the rot. I'm not in denial of that reality. But I'm also confident, and even so much more confident, that those who transform nations are those who are not in power. Because the power of the people is certainly, unabrasively, unequivocally, undeniably stronger than the men in power. Thank you, Prof. We're still on Atlantic Discourse. We always give a voice to the unheard. We balance the information equation always, and we serve as a bridge between the developing and the developed world. So we're still talking to Professor Chris Mustafa Wakubia, the convener of the Country First Movement. He has said a lot. He has provided solution, And I think the key thing there is that the office of the citizen has to wake up. I think my late dad will not be happy with you. You know I'm Christopher Wakubia Jr., not... You know, he was senior, and my son is okay. Chris Walker by the board. So there's a junior okay. in my name, like the okay. name of the Martin Luther King Jr., yes. Junior, <laughs> how hard is there? Apologies there. So we're talking to Professor Christopher Mustafa Nwakobia Jr. So, but like okay. I said, the key thing for me in all the things you've said is that the office of the citizen can rejuvenate the country, can start okay. a recalibration, that irrespective of which political party is in power, that mm. abdication of responsibility by citizens in the first instance is what led us to where we are. Because if you right. look at the percentage of voters we had during the last election, compared to what happened in Liberia, it is very appalling, considering that we had almost 90 million or more than a little more than 90 million registered voters, a very, very, um, not negligible, but mm. about 30% or less took their voters' card. And when it came to voting proper, it was even more abysmal and lower. So. From what you said, and the citizens have to come up. And I think every developed country in the world, the office of the citizen have played a strategic role. But let me put this to you. I mean, we both agree that there's nothing to be partisan about that we should just go for the two, which is what we're trying to do. Now, recently, former Vice President Atiku has been everywhere in the media, the court case, Supreme Court, and all that, said that all the opposition party against APC, talking about Labour Party should work with PDP, PDP should work with NMPP, NMPP should work with every, the Mushroom Party, the smaller parties, and all that. What's your position on that? I think you're actually putting it lightly. Your son may be very pragmatic. He actually called for a merger of the parties okay. uh, in parties. the opposition. Yes, and I said to him, and I did a short video which is out there, and I wrote about it. I said to him, no, it is not about the merger now. 
what you need is for the parties to reorganize themselves. Uh, one small party can give formidable opposition than 20 parties that are unorganized. And I said to my party, the Labour Party, that what is necessary and needed now is first to reorganize the Labour Party and take away transactional leaders. You know, hand the party over to the obedience. The obedience uh, redefined our moral margins in this country for 19 months. The some are even still saying, Bola Mertinubu is not my president. That's not because they are fascists or anarchists. No. What they're actually saying is, speaking to the conscience of our nation, that Nigeria is not a country of certificate forgers. Nigeria is not a country of those who undermine the electoral process. Nigeria is not a nation that has lost its moral margins. That's what they're saying. And now we're saying that the time for Labour Party to have a new leadership is now. And along with several kind-spirited Nigerians, a coalition for a new Nigeria, and several other persons who are within the Labour Party who are pushing for that, we're saying that it's time up for Julius Aburi. We need a new Labour. We need to organize a convention and have a party that, that is strong and ready to have a shadow government. You know, in the parliamentary systems, you have what you call a shadow cabinet. We want a shadow government here in Nigeria, not precisely a shadow cabinet, but we want to have, when the government says it wants to borrow more money, we want to be able to say, no, you don't need to borrow more money. This is where you can get more money without overtaxing the Nigerian people. When the government says, oh, we want to go to Japan or to Saudi Arabia to ask people to come and invest, two times within the short spell of this government, this government has tried to play populism. And just about that same time, a highly progressive word says to them, you don't use us for image stunt. Remember what happened in UAE when they mm. said, oh, the government has resolved issues about flight, this thing and all that. And uh, UAE has said, OK, we well, have lifted the visa. And that country wakes up and says, this is not what we discussed. You don't use us for image stunts. And right there and then, they came out and disowned what the government had said. Remember what happened a few days ago in Saudi Arabia? Mm -hmm. How dare mm -hmm. you go to your competitors to beg them to come and invest in your oil sector? You're an oil mm -hmm. producing country. Saudi Arabia is an oil producing country. You come to it just like Boa Cement going to Dangote to say, oh, I need you to give me expertise to improve on my cement production. <laughs> Who does that? You know, that's how funny it has become. The falsehood, perfidy, and propaganda has become an instrument of state. And so we need a party that can say no to some of these policy somersaults and wrong policy articulation. And that's why I'm saying that Labour Party must first reorganize, have those who are ready to play this role, and effectively so. When you do that, the PDP perhaps will take the challenge and go through a, a process of reorganization. When the PDP does so, NMPP, several other parties will wake up and say, let us put the house in order. And when you put these houses in order and begin to talk about a measure, then the APC will know that it's got something big coming. But wishing it into existence, no such thing happens in human existence. You take particular programmatic steps at certain things. So I have said to Atiku Abubakar and those who are jumping at it, no, you don't put the cart before the horse. Get ready. Repair your houses if need be, reorganize your houses if need be, restructure your houses if need be, and then we can begin to possibly, after that, talk about the need for a measure. But at this point, what Nigeria needs is a Labour Party run by obedience, controlled by ideologues, led by people who are not transactional, and a party that truly cares about encapsulating the collective aspirations of the Nigerian people. That's what we need. And that's the way to go. So I think that when we all do that, our search for a new republic would have begun. But when we think that just throwing words in the air is the way out, unfortunately, it would be like a wait for Godot. Well, some you know very well, that's a Dele Faro to me, who's also part of the obedient family, said something about, I'm paraphrasing now, he said that we cannot vote the problem in way the break is a problem and all that, that's, that it cannot be voted, that the solution is not going to be via ballot, which I think that's where I understand it to be, that, that you can't vote it the way. I, I, I don't think he said what will be the solution, 
but it's a bit of a contradiction to what you're saying. You're saying go legislative, go organize, vote. But he's also a member of the movement. He said it cannot be voted away, considering the brazen show of force, mismanagement, toggery, and everything you've seen that you can't vote it away. That voting is not even a solution. It's on the list. Now, that's my last question. I have one more for you. I just chipped that in before I ask you a final question. So what's your reaction to Mr. Dele Farrell's opinion? You know, my brother Dele is very deep and very philosophical. What I heard him say and how I understand the language is the need to give primacy to the power of the people over the man in power. You know, if you continue to stifle the rights of the people to electing their leaders, you cannot also take away their right to say no. You know, he was actually talking in deep philosophical terms. Okay, considering the fact that you have succeeded in capturing the electoral process, can you capture the conscience and the soul of the people? If we decide to storm the National Assembly and say they must do what we want, can you stop it? If we decide to insist on our state governors doing what is proper, tried and right, can you stop it? If we decide to ensure that local government chairmen spend their, their budgets justifiably and justifiably in ensuring that the society is better, can you stop it? So what Dele was saying in deep terms was to say to the people, if they stop you from electing your leaders the way you want, they cannot stop the guard on your conscience, the chain on your conscience to pull down your slavery to pull up your nation, to take your nation out of the morass to the place of promise. They cannot stop it. So his call is actually a call to the people to rise, to say beyond a stunted electoral process, beyond a compromised democratic space, you have the life, you have the strength, and you have the power to say no. And I believe truly that the time has come for the Nigerian people to begin to defy the leadership when leadership is irresponsible. Again, that takes me back to the preacher from Atlanta, Georgia. He said clearly, and I quote him, that disobeying an unjust law is actually the greatest respect for the law. He said that defiance is a cross on a conscience that says, this is not right. And he says, I will not do wrong because you're doing right. I think that the time has come for us to understand, and, and clearly so, that this nation is calling for men and women who are able to look in the face of those who and the corridors of power and say to them, truly, you are actually supposed to be representing me, not plodding it on me. You are actually supposed to do what I want as a citizen. Like you know, that the office of a citizen is the highest office. It's number one office in the land, you know. So my brother was saying the time for the people to understand that they are actually the owners of power is now, and we must mm. act like we own the power. We must begin to call leadership to responsible actions. Seven, except that is done, nobody's going to give you what you simply and wistfully think will come. Power is not sober like that, like Tinubu also says to me. But we're not going to steal I'm, I'm, we're, not yeah. gonna <laughs> we're not going to run away with it. We will take it for good. <laughs> Interesting. Nice having you, but you still have to answer one more question for me. That you know, the economy is really, really, very bad state. The Nigerian economy is really, really bad. And I read, I think, some days ago, where the Minister for Finance said that the foreign direct investment to Nigeria is not trickling in the way they want. People are not showing interest. So, do you think the election results, the certificate issues, and other moral burden that the president carries with him are affecting? the stunted growth of the economy. I mean, for God's sake, we just had an election, we have a new president. It is at least expected that the minimum, you know, things should pick up, you know, it should be a plus for the economy, you know, despite the eight years, the terrible eight years of war, in which nobody disputes, because even the APC is calling it a terrible period now. So do you think the moral baggage is that, you know, that affected person of the current president is affecting the, the path to development of Nigeria currently. Now, let me say that if you hadn't asked me this question, somehow in my closing remark, I would have brought it in. But uh, you are now the Nostradamus. Yeah, you might as well, well make your closing remark now also. So, it's not yeah, so let, let me take it along. 
Interestingly, yeah. let me say, you don't go begging for foreign direct investments when there are billions of dollars in Nigeria that NFIU is sitting on and has refused to give to those who brought it to do business. I had addressed the World Press Conference about a month ago where we talked about, and I did this will blow your mind, there are over 250 to $300 billion accruing to Nigeria. Some of these monies are in Nigeria. Some out there that this government can assess. Unfortunately, because those who superintend government are largely unpatriotic, they're not ready to do You go back for $4.2 billion, $1.5 billion, when you have these monies in Nigeria, and those who brought in some of these monies to do business are disappointed. They are not ready to bring in more money because of the credibility question. Between MFLA and Mele Kiari, you can trace well over $50 billion. And these are facts verifiable. We have asked the government, because some people have asked me, why are you trying to help this government get these funds? We have a consortium that has access to some of we have facts and figures. And then I've said to government, you have to unlock these resources before those people will bring in more money. MFLA and Co, they know what they did with our economy, and that's part of why they're dragging him up and down. Then ask yourself, what about that $4.8 billion accruing from 48 million barrels of crude oil that was stolen and stored up in China? A court in Abuja here has given directive to the group CEO of NMPC Limited to tell the world where the money is and what they have done with the money. So these are not spurious issues. A whistleblower, my friend and partner, George Ubo, had raised these issues. They are documented. What about the $26.5 billion that MTN and their SPVs have taken out of this country? The DSS have done investigation on, on it. And I've asked the government to take action. Why are you going a borrowing when you have so much money that are accrued to you? So I am as surprised as every logical Nigerian. I am baffled and bothered that you want people who have their money strapped in Nigeria to bring in more monies. No. The right thing to do is to call them to the table, unlock the resources, the ones that you suspect the source of funds, you put to arbitration and to the justice system, the ones that were frozen because some people wanted to divert the monies, you unlock them for growth and progress. And that's the way to go, my dear brother. I, I, I think that the time has come for us to say to this government, Enough of going around the world to ask to beg for money. We're not a beggarly nation. We're a nation blessed by God with amazing resources and riches in fable. Let me say to you, I've heard some people say, oh, Nigeria is not necessarily a rich country. That's not true. Subject Nigeria to economic forensics. you find out. Today, people said a few months ago that Niger will die out of hunger. Are you aware today that one of the fastest growing economies in Africa today is Niger? Nigeria yeah, was selling uranium for $17, now sells uranium for over $170. You know, when you take responsibility, when you have leaders who are ready to fix their country, you don't go begging for money from Saudi Arabia to United Arab Emirates, people that otherwise are not richer than you are, to France, to Germany. You don't do that. Buried in our soil of the 46 most priceless mineral resources in the, in the world, we have well over 37 of these resources in Nigeria. How can you say we're poor? We have uranium, we have gold, we have tantalite, we have columbite, we have wealth that you cannot undermine. And then what about the human resources? Silicon Valley, go and see outside Indians, Nigerians are the best in IT across the world. What are we talking about a day? We have the best experts in the world and you're talking about a nation this blessed by God with amazing resources and riches in a fable, and our people are hungry and poor? Who does that? Who explains this away? You know, I think that the time has come for us to challenge leadership to responsible and responsive action and stop petting them. Oh, we don't have... Nobody will come with so much resources as is trapped in Nigeria already with the kind of credibility challenges you have. You know, like you noted... They are yet to come to terms with the fact that you have an election that was largely lampooned by the people and the judiciary gave it a thumbs up to it. And so they're asking themselves, if we have a problem here, to who do we run to? 
And then they are asking themselves about the lifespan of international arbitration. If you can't get justice in Nigeria and you want to go for international arbitration, it might take you 20 years. Okay? They're looking at these realities. They're looking at so many things. So what this government must do is, first of all, look inward. Look at how it can unlock the resources trapped inside of Nigeria. And between you and I, Ade, there's so much we can do about it if this government is willing, ready, and able to come down from its high horse, engage with people who can do this. We're available. We're ready. Because for me, it's country first. I may not like the APC, but don't also forget that it's just about 19 months ago that I left the APC. So I still have friends and brothers there. I may not like the administration of Bola Ahmed Tinubu, but don't also forget that I used to be one of their best friends whilst he was governor of Lagos State. And, uh, and then don't forget also that I was DG Change Ambassadors of Nigeria when Buhari was running. So I don't hate anybody. What I don't like is the lack of dedication and commitment to national ideals. What I don't like is when men make me, myself, and I a policy of state. What I don't like is when they turn perfidy and mendacity to an instrument of national propaganda. And what I really want is a country that works for all. And that's my commitment. That's my prayer. And that's a wish that I have for the Nigerian people. And so I'll close this beautiful, I'm enamored by you, what you do, your commitment to motherland, your commitment to Africa. God will bless you. I salute your team. But I want to say, like the preacher from Atlanta, Georgia, would say, there's a dream. I have a dream that sooner rather than later, we have a country that works for the masses of our people. I have a dream that sooner rather than later, a nation messed up by leadership will rise up because the people will decide to take ownership of their nation and challenge leadership to responsible action. I have a dream that sooner rather than later, our people will say to the world, the giant has risen, and new values and new margins will be drawn. I have a dream, and I'm sure this dream will come true, because the God who runs the human pilgrimage is alive and well, that this country will put primacy in the ability of our young people to do right and do great things. And finally, permit me bring in the quotes of James Russell Lowell. He said a long time ago, for those who have lost faith in Nigeria, he said a long time ago, when he wrote that poem, The Present Crisis, he said, truth forever on the scaffold, falsehood forever on the throne. That same scaffold sways the future. For behind the dim, unknown, standard God in the shadows, keeping watch above his own. The, the truth on the scaffold is simply, oh, when are we going to get it right? Why are you guys talking so much? Nigeria is lost. Nigeria is messed up. That's the falsehood on the throne. The truth on the scaffold is what we have said and what we've been talking about in this interview, that Nigeria can rise again and that if we work hard at it, we can make it happen. And behind this truth stands God, keeping watch above our country and above his own. Nigeria will get it right. This country will rise again. This country will do great things. And this country will truly become the pride of the black man and indeed Africa. Thank you, Professor Christopher Mustafa Wakovia Jr. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. You have spoken well. You've spoken like a patriot. And I like the way you put it. The citizens have to rise up. This battered, yes, I always say battered almost beyond repairs. But clearly, there's always a way out. I mean, there's no solution that is so bad. I mean, the Chinas of this world, if you look at China some 30 years back, was almost a sorry state to confusion everywhere, but they had to go inward. And for Nigeria, the largest population, the largest concentration of black people anywhere on the planet, we do not have an excuse, despite the multi-diversity, multi-religious, multi-ethnic base of our society. All those things we call obstacles and disadvantages. India has used it to its own advantage. So it clearly shows there is a way. Yes, we should vote the right people. The Office of Citizens have to rise up to the occasion. We have the requisite manpower. We all have to look inward and next. And you know, then it doesn't matter where the president comes from really. It doesn't matter what religion. We just have to use our best 11, like they say in football. We have to recalibrate 
things are not too good. The Naira is spiraling downwards every day. It does look like nothing is working really. And in our own estimate here, because we always look at all these things too, there's a lot of credibility crisis in the land and it's affecting the rejuvenation of the Nigerian economy. So we're going to call it a wrap there. Prof, thank you for coming. Clearly, this is your first interview. That means you're going to come back again because I'm sure a lot of our listeners, you know, our viewers will really enjoy what all the things you've said. You have looked at the crystal ball. You have predicted that there is a way out if the citizens decide to show more scrutiny, you know, and stay true to power. Thank you once again. Thank you, our viewers. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Thank you so, so much. I know you're in Lagos very early and uh, we'll say thank you. All right, we'll call it a wrap. Thank you, everybody. See you next time. We're coming with another bank, a very, very, very big bank. You know, a, a topic that everybody will be happy to discuss. Bye.